So to understand how we translate from those kind of um, from the wording of those questions into actual statistical tests, let's break down each of these questions. So our first question here is whether there's any differences in the proportion of high versus low somatic symptom burden individuals across our two experimental groups between the mindfulness group and the mind wandering control group. So what we can see in this particular hypothesis is that there's two variables that we're mentioning here, somatic symptom burden and experimental group. They're both categorical variables. They're both grouping variables with two categories or two groups each. And what we want to do is to compare the proportion of high versus low somatic symptom burdens across the two categories of experimental group. And because we've got two variables that are both categorical variables and we're comparing proportions across the categorical variables, the kind of test that we want to do is a chi-square test of independence. On to our next methodological check. So this one's seeing if the average dispositional mindfulness score of, our of the population from which our sample was drawn is the same as what's been found in previous research. And previous research has found that generally, in general, people have an average dispositional mindfulness score of 125. So the variable that's involved in this particular hypothesis is one single variable and it's dispositional mindfulness. So one variable only. It's a numeric variable, not categorical. It's a numeric variable. And what we want to do is to compare the mean of this numeric variable to some known external mean score. So I want to compare the mean dispositional mindfulness to a score of 125. And because that's what I'm doing, because it's a single variable, a numeric variable, and I want to compare the mean score to an external mean of 125, a one sample t-test is going to be the test that we use to address that particular question. And what I think you should do now is to go back to slide four and see if you can follow that logical process that I followed to get to the same conclusion with both of these questions. So to get to the chi-square test of independence for number one and the one sample t-test for number two. So question number one, are there any differences in the proportion of high versus low somatic symptom burden across our experimental groups? So the first thing I can do is to get a clustered bar chart, which is this graph here, to, so that I can just uh, essentially understand my data, describe my data in terms of a chart. So this clustered bar chart, as you can see here, is showing the low versus mild somatic symptom burden people in the blue bars and the moderate severe somatic symptom burden in the red bars. And we're looking at those between the mind wandering control group on the left and the mindfulness group on the right. And what we can see here is that the proportion of blue versus red bars across mind wandering versus mindfulness is really, really similar. It's almost identical. So the height of the blue bar versus the red bar on the left here is almost identical to the height of the blue bar versus the red bar on the right hand side. And that's suggesting to me that there's going to be no association between somatic symptom burden and the experimental group it's suggesting to me that these two variables are going to be independent. Before we can actually formally test that though, we need to make sure that our assumptions are met for this chi-square test of independence. So our chi-square test of independence has three different assumptions, that our observations are independent, that the data are categorical, and that the expected frequency for each of our cells is at least five observations. The first two assumptions we already know are true, so we know that our observations are independent because we know that there's 100 people who were sampled and there are 100 individual people. No one was sampled twice. Nobody affected anybody else's score. We also know that our data are categorical by understanding the nature of these variables. So I know that somatic symptom burden is categorical. There's two categories, um, low, mild versus moderate, severe. And I also know that experimental group is categorical. There's two categories, mindfulness versus mind wandering control. So those two assumptions are met first, which is good. In order to check our third assumption, what we need to do is to get our cross tabs or our two way frequency table and to actually ask Stata what our expected frequencies are for each of the individual cells. We could do that by hand. So there was a formula in the chi-square um, lecture on how to calculate this by hand. It's actually quite easy, but an even easier thing to do is to get started to do it for us. So if I run this syntax, the tab syntax, and it 
um, it'll ask data to give us this two-way table of association, two-way frequency table. Um, and the second row in each of these cells gives us the expected frequency. And what we need to do is just to make sure that each of these numbers is bigger than five. So you can see here that all of them are exactly bigger than five. 12.5 and 37.5 are all bigger than five, which means that assumption is met, which means that all three of these assumptions are met, and we can therefore go on to actually do our chi-square test of independence. So um, this is the syntax to do that at the top of the left-hand side there. And this gives us, again, the same table that was on the previous slide but it also gives us the Pearson chi-square statistic down the bottom of the table there. So what we can see here, looking at the actual statistical test results, we have a Pearson's chi-square statistic of 0 0.0533, a p-value that goes along with that of 0.817, and comparing that p-value to our critical alpha, and our critical alpha always being 0 0.05, an alpha level or a p-value of 0 0.05, we can see that 0.817 is bigger than 0.05, and therefore this is a non-significant result. And a non-significant result in terms of the chi-square test of independence means that these two variables are not related to each other. That experimental group is not related to somatic symptom burden. So what we can conclude here is that there's no significant difference in the proportion of individuals with high versus low somatic symptom burden across the two experimental groups. And we can quote, we can quote our chi-square test statistic there and our p-value. And what that's telling us is that there's no differences between the groups at baseline, and that's a really good thing. So there's no inherent differences between the experimental group and the control group in terms of their somatic symptom burden. So that means that any effect that we get of our group variable, of our mindfulness variable, is not confounded by somatic symptom burden. It's not going to be due to inherent differences in somatic symptom burden. And that's a really good thing. Our second methodological check here is to see if the average dispositional mindfulness score is equal to 125. So this is our distribution of dispositional mindfulness down the bottom here. It's the same that was on a couple of slides ago. And we know that this is the one sample t-test that we'll use to test this particular check. And the one sample t-test has three different assumptions. Our variable is a numeric variable. It's a normally distributed numeric variable. And our observations are independent. Again, we can answer um, assumption number one and assumption number three already because we know that mindfulness, dispositional mindfulness is a numeric variable. We understand that just by understanding the nature of the variable and by looking at the distribution of the variable. And we also know that our observations are independent, just like the previous test. So the only assumption that we need to actually formally check here is the normality of the distribution of dispositional mindfulness. And we can do that in part by looking at the histogram and looking at this and seeing that, yes, it is an approximately normal distribution. It looks like that kind of bell, show, bell curve shape. Remember that normal data is never going to look perfect. It's never going to look as perfect as kind of the, the pictures that you might see but this looks pretty good. It looks approximately normal. And we can confirm our kind of eyeballing of this graph by actually running the Shapiro-Wilk test itself. And remember that the Shapiro-Wilk test is a test of, no of the normality of the variable. And what we want in order for this assumption of normality to be met, what we want is a non-significant Shapiro-Wilk test, i.e. a p-value that's bigger than 0.05. And what we can see here is that our p-value for this particular test is 0.796, which is definitely bigger than 0.05. And therefore, we can say that that assumption is met, that our variable is normally distributed. Whoops. And therefore, all of our three assumptions are met for this one sample t-test, which means we can proceed to actually doing the test itself. So to run the one sample t-test, we use the t-test command and write dm total equals 125 because that's our test value. That's the average score that we want to compare our average score against. And what we can see here, the results of this test, is that, as we know before, the mean score in our sample of dispositional mindfulness is 125. Our t-statistic that corresponds with this one sample t-test is 0 0.19, which is very, very small. And it goes along with quite a large p-value, so a smaller t-statistic 
bigger p-value and that p-value is 0.8477. Comparing that against our critical alpha of 0.05, if our t-test p-value was less than 0.05, we would conclude that this is a significant um, effect, significant difference here. But because our p-value is bigger than 0.05, it's much bigger than 0.05, what that means is that this mean score is not significantly different to 125. So we can conclude that the mean dispositional mindfulness score is not significantly different to 125. And then we can quote our t-statistic and our p-value there. And what that means is that in the population from which our sample was drawn, their natural mindfulness score is comparable to, pop to the populations that have been used in previous research. So the population from which our sample was drawn is not different in terms of dispositional mindfulness to that of other populations. Our sample, the population which our sample was drawn, is no more or less naturally mindfulness, inherently mindful. And again, that's a good thing. So these two methodological checks are just things that we wanted to make sure were true in order to validate the results or any kind of results we might get from our study. So that's good. Both of those two things are consistent with our expectations. So because of that, we can now proceed with actually formally testing those four hypotheses that we've got.